I can't remember the moment at which I decided to become an academic historian. That was probably when I did well enough as an undergrad. But there's one incident I remember when I, I must have been 12, and I was listening to the radio. We hadn't got television in those days. And there was a program every Sunday called the Brains Trust, which were four men, always men, uh, who were very, very smart, and they were asked questions, often sent in by listeners. And the exchange I remember was this. The questioner said, what is the similarity between the Battle of Stalingrad and the Battle of Cannae? I remember the answer came from someone called uh, uh, Dennis Brogan, who is a historian and a Scot. And he paused and he said, well, they're both battles and one of them involves Rome and Carthaginia and the other, or even Russia and Germany, so that can't be it. And then 216 BC, 1942, so it's not the date. And he went through four or five alternatives, and in the end said, mm, yes. And the general defeated was mm, Emilius Paulus at Cannae and Friedrich von Paulus at Stalingrad. I think that may be the connection you want. And I'm thinking, whatever 12 year olds say for wow, I'd like to do that when I grow up. Uh, when Eliot turns, he's giving, Sir John is giving a course of lectures on European history. And at this particular one, he's talking about the Netherlands and in particular, the Dutch revolt. This is clearly a, a, a subject that interests him. He becomes animated. He has a, a map, uh, cutting edge technology in, in the universities of the 1960s. He has a map on the wall behind him and he points to it and he says, what no one has explained is how Spain for 80 years managed to send troops and treasure all the way from Spain to Italy, Italy to Franche Comte, and all the way to the Netherlands. How was it done? And so when John Eliot mentioned this logistical problem of how do you get 7,000, 10,000 Spaniards to the Netherlands to fight the Dutch, how was it done? That interested me a lot. I have always liked to go and meet historians, the historians whose books I've read, I like to meet them. And one day I was doing research near Grenoble where the uh, noted Hispanist Henri Lapère lived. And I went to see him, I got an audience. And uh, at the end of uh, getting advice, I said, so if you were me, professor, what would you do? And he said, well, I remember there's a series in Simancas that no one has ever made any sense of. And you're young, you can afford it. Spend three days looking at those documents. And if you find the answer, you're made. And if you've wasted three days, what does that matter to you? You're young. The pile of documents was about this big. There'd be no, uh, uh, no one had looked at them. How do I know that? Because they were covered in dust. Every time I turn it over, a pile of ink comes down on me. But I recognize the names. I realize why nobody has identified them before. These are the names of each of the regiments of the Spanish army in the Netherlands, and these were their pay sheets and it lasted for 40 years. So 40 years of documents, just fantastic. Every historian has felt at some time in their life that feeling at the back of the hairs in the back of their neck go up and down because they've seen something that no one's seen before or they've seen the significance of something that no one has seen before. That's what I felt that day. But you might have asked me, what was the best day in my life? And that would have been the day my, my first child, my daughter, was born. I remember I was 22 and I felt better than I think I've ever done before or since as I walked down the road as a father for the first time.